Hi, welcome back to the Network Plus Certification Video Series. I'm Mike Redmond, Master Trainer, here to help guide you through your successful journey of becoming a Network Plus Certified Technician. We're going to walk through a wide variety of topics, starting with basic network concepts all the way through network management and security. In this segment, we're going to talk about installing a physical network. I'll help you recognize and describe the functions of basic components in a structured cabling system, explain the processes of installing structured cable, show you how to install a network interface card, and perform basic troubleshooting on a structured cable network. When we sit down to design our networks, we have a nice and tidy and orderly idea in mind. We know that everything has a place and everything should be in its place. However, the reality of the situation is that real world networks aren't very tidy or orderly at all. They can be just a series of cabling and equipment strewn on the floor around your office. To combat this problem, we have developed what's called the Structured Cabling System. We're going to talk about the Structured Cabling System and exactly what goes into it in the different pieces and parts. So the TIA organization set the standards for what we call structured cabling. It details every aspect of a cabled network, from the type of cabling that you must use, the position of wall outlets, and a whole lot more. The goal to this was to create a safe and reliable cabling infrastructure. This applies to all networks, telephonic, video, anything that needs low power distributed cabling. You need to understand these three important issues. The cabling basics of structured cabling, what network components go into it, and understand the assessment of connections leading outside of the network. Starting with the cabling basics, it's basically a star is born. Well, more to the point, the topology of a star. At its heart, the most basic network is a switch, some sort of UTP cable, and some PCs. So you see a switch, some UTP cable, and some PCs. This is a star network, fairly simple. However, the problem that we have is keeping it simple. Obviously, for safety factors, a switch in the middle of an office space just isn't practical. You have a bunch of exposed cables that are vulnerable to physical damage, and the signals themselves, or you can think of it as the data, is exposed to a lot of electrical interference in these office spaces. And then also, with such a chaotic mess, it really does limit your ability to make changes to the network. So the solution really is a better installation design that provides for safety and provides for hardware to be organized and protected, but also give you the flexibility of different cabling standards if you need it. Enter the structured cabling network components. They consist of the telecommunications room, a horizontal cabling, and a work area. The telecommunications room really is nothing more than where all the network lines terminate. The way they get to your telecommunications room is typically called the horizontal cabling. It runs from the work area to the telecommunications room. The requirement to meet the structured cabling standards is that you must use CAT5E cabling or better, either solid core or stranded core. Now, solid core is a better conductor than stranded core. However, it will break if it's mishandled. Stranded core 
it's not as good a conductor. However, it does stand up to handling without breaking. So here's a look at a diagram of where your horizontal cabling would run from each workstation, possibly either through the floor or up to the ceiling or a wall, all the way over to the telecommunications room. So your horizontal cabling will consist of a number of strands. Four pair UDP is kind of assumed to be the standard. However, for high end telephone setups, they do make 25 and 100 pair UDP. So understand when you're choosing your cabling, you just need to understand what the network requirements are. Do you need CAT 5e or do you need CAT 6? Uh, do you need fiber? And if so, what type of fiber? It's always a good idea when installing physical attributes to a network, you want to do what we call future proofing it. That is, you install a higher rated cable than what is needed today to protect against future requirements. So your telecommunications room is the basic heart of your star. It's the beginning of the intermediate distribution frame or the IDF. It's the endpoint of all of your horizontal runs. This is also the central component to your equipment racks. The equipment racks themselves are essentially a safe, stable platform for hardware components. It's where your networking equipment lives. A standard equipment rack is 19 inches wide. However, the heights will vary. Some will be very small and some will go from the floor to the ceiling. What's important is the standardization of it. We consider all network equipment that goes into equipment racks to be in sizes of U. 1.75 inches is a U. So when you hear that a piece of equipment is either one or two or four U in size, that's what they're referring to. Here's a look at a short equipment rack, about three or four feet tall. And here's a look at a larger equipment rack running all the way from the floor to the ceiling. The next component of the telecommunications room is the patch panel box. Essentially, it's a row of female connectors, the ports, if you will, that are in front, the permanent connections to your horizontal cables run in the back. A patch down panel you'll also hear referred to as a 110 punch down block. To connect your twisted pairs to the patch panel, you're gonna use what's called a punch down tool. Here's a look at a typical rack mounted UPS. Notice the size, it is one U in size or 1.75 inches. And here's a look at your typical patch panel. The front, your female connectors, and on the back side is where you will use to punch down your UTP. This is a punch down tool. Here's how you'll use the punch down tool, punching down the stranded wires onto a 110 block. And when you're done, it will look like this. Now this isn't a 110 block, this is a 66 block patch panel. However, don't get lost in the numbers, just understand the concepts. So when dealing with the patch panel box, it's extremely important to label the cable connections on the panel. You should be sure to use a simple labeling scheme. 
the TAEA 606 standard can be somewhat confusing. There are a wide variety of configurations to use, whether it's UTP, STP, or fiber, and forget about the ports 8, 12, all the way up to 48. The only true standardization comes with the labeling of the patch panel itself. Just like the UTP, the patch panel comes with UTP ratings. That UTP rating must match the type of twisted pair that you're using in the patch panel. Next, we'll talk about the different types of cables. You're going to connect the patch cables to the ports on the front of the panel. These patch cables should be relatively short in size, ranging from about two to five feet. Now you can buy pre-made UTP patch cables, however, it's not that difficult to do it yourself. Here's a look at a typical pre-made patch panel. So now our network is really starting to take shape. The racks are installed, the horizontal cabling is run, now all we have to do is define our work area. The work area is a wall outlet. It will consist of a female jack with a cat rating and a mounting plate and face plate. This is where you will connect the PC to the wall outlet with the patch cable. When troubleshooting, you'll usually start in the work area as the source of a lot of network failures. Here's a look at what a typical work area would look like. And just like your patch panels, it's important to label the faceplate. So now that you have the basics of a simple star, understand that all we've done is really structured a single floor. To cable an entire building can get a lot more complex and most LANs connect to both the internet and a telephone company. Now, perhaps you're dealing with a home setup. Well, this would be a typical home network interface box that you would run your exterior connections, like from your cable company, and then from here, throughout your home or small office, to the rest of your endpoints. This basic setup is pretty easy for most people to understand. However, a typical building-wide network is going to include a high-speed backbone run. Those are usually the vertical runs, and that backbone will connect to multi-speed switches on each floor. And again, what's an office without telephones? you're going to need dedicated telephone cabling backbone runs alongside your vertical runs. These are all going to run to what is identified as the demark or the demarcation point. Basically, the demark is the network's connection to the outside world. It is the dividing line of responsibility. It's where your responsibility ends and your telephone or cable providers picks up. For instance, with your home setup, your DSL or cable modem serves as the DMARC point. In an office building, they will have what's identified as a smart jack that is inside the network interface unit. This enables your ISP to do remote testing. Here's a look at a typical office DMARC. And here's a look at a vertical cross connect that runs from floor to floor. And here's a look at what the telephone vertical cross connect will look like. So now that we understand the DMARC itself, 
your connections are at the DMARC extension. This extension is what connects to the main patch panel. That's called a vertical cross connect. And from that vertical cross connect, you'll run to the MDF or the main distribution frame. It's just another name really for the telecommunications room. So now that you understand the basics of structured cabling, let's take a look at how to install it. It all starts with the floor plan. The floor plan is the key to proper planning. Remember, you usually only do this once or twice, so it's best to sit down and plan it all out ahead of time. This is where you're going to determine the potential locations for your telecommunications room. You'll also locate the physical firewalls, give an overall feel for the scope of the job that you're about to perform. If a floor plan isn't available, I would highly recommend that you create one. It doesn't have to be pretty. It can be just a simple hand-drawn floor plan. But taking a little time to do this can save you a lot of headache and heartache later. Next, we need to map our runs. We need to determine the length of each cable run, determine the route that that cable is going to take, and determine the location of each drop or cable drop. This is usually where you're going to have to begin getting input from users in management. They are the ones that know where they need their computer to sit in the room or the office, and also whether or not you should install extra drops, again, to future-proof your job. This will also help you begin to determine the total cost that installing the network is going to be. You'll also need to decide if these cable runs are going to be inside or outside of the wall. If you're going to install outside of the walls, at that point you'll need to install what's called raceways. And of course, it is paramount that you remember to document everything. Here's a look at what a raceway would look like. Next, we need to determine the location of the telecommunications room. Remember, the distance can be no more than 90 meters from your drops, and you have to take in consideration the power requirements for the equipment that will be installed in the telecommunications room. What are the humidity and cooling requirements, and who requires access to it? Here's a look at the AC duct that is cooling my communications room. One of the skills that a Network Plus certified technician are often called on to do is to pull cable. Now, this activity typically requires two or three people to do, and you're going to start in the telecommunications room and then pull towards your outward drops. Generally, to do this, you're going to need to open up the drop ceilings and you'll string the cable via hooks or what's called cable trays. Here's a look at what cable trays will look like above the drop ceiling. So when pulling cable, the first and probably the most important is good cable management. You need to be sure to be aware of what are the local codes and be prepared because vertical drops can be pretty difficult. You'll also need to consider whether you'll need to install a low voltage mounting rack to hold faceplates and you'll use a cable guide to help you organize equipment closets. Here's a look at what not to do. Much better. So now that you've pulled your cable, now we need to think about making connections. Connecting to the work areas themselves 
you're going to need to crimp well, wall jack and wire, you're going to need to mount a faceplate, and you'll need to fit the jack itself into that faceplate. Often, this is going to require you to cut a hole in the wall. Once complete, you'll reach in and locate the pulled wire. This is pretty easy to do with a simple screw and some string. Next, you'll install the mounting bracket. And here's a look at the end of some cables guided to the rack. Yeah, all of that is going to a drop somewhere in the building. So remember, I told you, you can buy your own UTP cabling, but like I said, it really is pretty simple to do your own. You only need a few tools, and as a matter of fact, let me walk you through exactly how to do it. To start with, you'll use simple stranded UTP cable that's going to match whatever cat level of your horizontal runs. You'll use special crimp for a stranded cable. Uh, you'll use an RJ45 crimper and the built-in stripper, and you'll also need a pair of wire snips. So it really all starts with the jack. Here's a look at how to crimp a jack. And here's a look at a crimper and the wire snips that are connected to it. After you cut your wire, you'll need to strip back the sheathing so you can expose the twisted pairs that you're going to need. Then, simply grab your RJ45 cable and you'll insert those wires in the individual strands inside the RJ45. They're numbered 1 through 8. Once you have them properly placed inside the RJ45, you'll grab your crimper again, and then you will crimp the cable. When you're done, it should look something like this. Now, although not required, it's usually a pretty good idea to go ahead and add a boot. Now, with our newly created UTP cable, we can continue connecting to the patch panels. Again, you're going to need to practice good cable management, and it really should be organized to mirror the layout of your network. Here's a look at what you should not do. Much better. Next, we test. You're going to need to verify each cable run can handle the anticipated network speed. Now, you can spend money on sophisticated network testing tools. They can run anywhere between five and $10,000, or you can have some lower end tools that work for basic network testing. They'll do things like uh, tell you the length of cables, identify if there are any broken wires or location of a possible break. They can also tell you whether the wires have been terminated in the correct place, locate electrical or radio interference, and even test for crosstalk. Really, it all starts with the cable tester. This is going to verify that cables are terminated and those ends are terminated correctly. At the low end, you have continuity testers. Now, better testers run actual wire mapping to pick up whether there are any shorts or cross wires. You'll also want to have your multimeter handy to test for continuity. Here's a look at what a continuity tester looks like. And here is a multimeter.
Next, you have the TDR, or a time domain reflectometer. It's fairly moderately priced and really good at doing wire mapping. Additionally, it will also test the lengths of cable and the location of any possible breaks, and most of them will come with a loopback device. This is what a typical TDR looks like. Now, if you have the money and you feel like spending it, some of the higher end testers, like cable certifiers, they are going to be able to identify for you anywhere you have any crosstalk, whether it is near end crosstalk or far end crosstalk. Also, it will be able to tell you the attenuation on the network lines. One of the most popular is the Microtest Omni Scanner. So I've now thrown a couple new words at you, uh, crosstalk, near-end crosstalk, and far-end crosstalk. Near-end and far-end crosstalk just simply means you have noise on the line, some sort of electromagnetic interference interfering with the transmission on the cable. This can generally be eliminated by separating wires, or you may have to locate the source of the EMI. When dealing with near-end crosstalk, it's usually somewhere close to you, and since you are going to usually be doing this testing in the telecommunications room, that gives you a good idea of where you're going to need to start searching along the line for sources of EMI. Versus far-end crosstalk. Far-end crosstalk is generally going to be out closer to the work area. Here's a look at a microtester, for instance, transmitting on wire pair one and two. And then on the far end, you have another microtester that is listening on wire pair three and six. So these are all good ways to identify issues with copper cabling. However, if you've decided that you need fiber, there are some different processes involved. For instance, the termination process is a bit more involved with fiber, and there are some problems that you can encounter, both like and some unlike with UTP. The termination process for fiber includes doing any stripping and polishing of the end of the tiny fiber cable, as well as gluing and then inserting the actual connector itself. Now, fiber does not experience crosstalk, but fiber does break. So to check for breaks in the fiber, you will test with an optical time domain reflectometer, or OTDR. Here's a look at an older fiber termination kit. That's a lot of gear. Now, TIA has some very complex and somewhat rigorous requirements for testing fiber. To be a fiber certifier, you must need to know how to test for attenuation or the diffusion of the light over distance, as well as looking for any light leakage. This can occur when fiber is bent too much. Here's a look at a typical OTDR. And here's a look at how you'll test for any light leakage. Note the color glow at the bend, but the dark cable at the straight. Next, let's take a look at the different types of NICs. As a Network Plus certified As a Network Plus certified technician, you need to be able to recognize different types of NICs pretty much on site, as well as know how to install and troubleshoot those NICs. Starting with a 
common UTP Ethernet NIC, they are all going to use an RJ45 connector. They'll also be part of the cable runs from the NIC to the hub or switch. Here's a look at a typical UTP NIC. Now, fiber optic NICs, they come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. There are multiple standards you can use, however, they use the same connector types. It's important that you check the documentation to determine what standard card supports what. When buying NICs, often you're going to refer to brand names like 3Com or Intel. You also need to understand and know the different type of multi-speed requirements. It's usually a pretty good idea to stick with the same model for all the systems on your network. The act of physically installing the NIC is a pretty straightforward. However, many computers already have a NIC built in. They're plugged into what's called expansion slots in the PCs themselves. Those expansion slots are called PCIs, or Peripheral Component Interconnects. After a successful physical installation of the NICs, you'll need to install the proper drivers. You'll insert the driver CD when prompted, or the operating system itself may already have the appropriate driver. However, it's important to verify that the driver was properly installed. For Windows operating systems, you'll use the device manager. Uh, if you're operating on a Linux machine, you'll want to look in the network app. Or if you're dealing with a Mac, you'll go to preferences and then the network utility. Next, you'll test for what's called bonding or link aggregation. With bonding, it can double, or even more, the speed between the machine and the switch. This is usually accomplished by adding two or more NICs to a computer. Here's a look at a typical fiber NIC. This happens to be a 3COM. And here's a look at a typical UTP NIC. and a PCIe NIC. Here is a USB NIC. Regardless of the type of NIC that you're dealing with, they're all going to have link lights. UTP NICs have little LEDs that indicate the state of the link that you're dealing with. Generally, you'll have one to four link lights per card, you need to be sure to check the link lights whenever you're troubleshooting. Many fiber optic NICs, however, don't have link lights. Here's a look at a pretty good connection. To verify the end-to-end -end connection of fiber, you'll use an optical connection tester. Basically, it's a flashlight that you'll plug one end of the fiber into, and then on the other end, you'll look for that light to come through. When you see the light, you know you have the correct line, and you can continue terminating the fiber. Next, we'll take a look at how to diagnose and repair some physical cabling. It all begins with proper diagnosis. You'll need to remove any software network issues. You can do this through a series of steps. You'll need to identify whether you're dealing with any software network issues or possibly some hardware issues. For instance, if you get an error, no server found, that's usually indicative of a hardware-based issue, less a network software-based issue.
Next, be sure to check for any available link lights. You'll want to check the NIC itself. Perhaps it's come unseated inside the computer. Or, quite possibly, you might have a switch that has failed. Here's a look at a Windows 7 machine at a disconnected NIC. Next, you'll want to check and verify that any shared resources are still available. You'll also want to go through and visually check the cable, or, or possibly get a cable tester to check for any breaks. If a cable tester isn't available, you can take the machine and plug it into a known good outlet and see if the problem fixes itself. If so, quite possibly you are dealing with a broken cable. To check the NIC, the best place to check, for instance in Windows, is in the Device Manager. However, you might be required to do what's called a loopback test. This is an internal check of the circuitry. What you'll need is what's called a loopback plug. Here's a look at what a loopback plug looks like. At the conclusion of your loopback test, there might be some other cable testing required. Remember, most problems occur in the work area. So after eliminating any work area problems, now you're going to have to go a little bit deeper. This is where, for instance, the TDR might come in handy. The next best place to start looking would be in the telecommunications room. Take note as to whether or not you're possibly having any power problems, or are there any temperature fluctuations in the room. Another tool used for cable testing are toners. They trace cable runs throughout the building, and it requires two separate devices. You'll have a tone generator and a tone probe. Fox and Hound makes an outstanding toner. And you can get toners that will also include phone jacks for communications. Next, you should look at your power supplies. Do you have a UPS? If you do, is it online? Check the standby power. And environmental issues like temperature fluctuations or humidity. It's always a good idea to install environmental monitors. They're fairly inexpensive, and they keep a constant watch on the temperature and humidity that's in your telecommunications room. Well, there you have it. Pretty simple, right? I know, it can be a lot of information coming at you all at once, but don't worry, I'm here to guide you every step of the way. You can do this. Just remember, study hard, lots of practice questions, and you will succeed. You will become a Network Plus Certified Technician. I'll see you next time.